Hello everyone. Welcome to the Center for Spiritual Living Victoria Online. My name is Carrie Hunter and I'm the Spiritual Director of the Center and it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. And if you'd like to drop in to see us in person, you know where to find us, 380 Cook Street in Victoria, in the um, Victoria uh, Cook Street Village Activity Center. We'd love to see you there some Sunday morning and to really um, have a good visit with you. Our services are at 10.30 a.m. for meditation and 11 o'clock for our regular service and then time for tea and coffee and some goodies afterward and some good conversation. So you're all invited. But meanwhile, it's great to have you here online. And I was watching the news the other night and I saw this story that just really touched my heart. It was McDonald House in Toronto. I had no idea how big McDonald House was, an, an enormous building. And outside there's this great huge garden that is a tranquility garden where people can go and, and sit and meditate. And of course, that particular house is to house families who are from out of town and who have children who are very sick and who are in the hospital there. So the families can be close to their loved one during treatment and, and um, even through palliative care, whatever it happens to be. It's really a remarkable place. Anyway, it showed these families with all their kids inside the building, and they were all wearing winter clothes and had, you know, toques on their heads. And you could tell the kids who were sick. I mean, their skin was very, very pale. There was one little girl in particular who looked really seriously ill. Many of them were wearing the toques to cover up their bald heads because they were in chemo treatment for cancer. That in itself was very moving. Anyway, after a couple of minutes with the kids just talking, some of them looking pretty listless and I think wondering why on earth they had to get all dressed up and be there and, you know, in warm clothing and so on because you could tell that some of them just did not feel like it. And then the doors opened up and out they went into this garden. Well, the garden most of the year is, is grass, snow in the winter, but a great big tree and, um, and a large sculpture. And it's a place where people can sit and meditate and pray. Anyway, a couple of people in Toronto completely transformed it. And that big, big garden was absolutely filled with lights. The tree was decorated with lights. There were Christmas decorations everywhere. There were reindeer that were made up of lights. There were, you know, a sleigh, um, all of the characters that we think of around Christmas time. But more than that, they had set up a little market and there were food carts so the children could go from cart to cart and they could get everything from cotton candy to hot dogs and drinks and whatever and I don't think anybody was worried about how healthy the food might be that night. Anyway to see the look on these children's faces some of them were jumping up and down with joy and the one little girl in particular who looked so ill all of a sudden had a smile on her face and her eyes lit up and I was just thinking how spectacular it is that that seeing lights, to see a garden filled with lights in particular, could bring such joy to children. And it brings joy to us, too. I know that just down the road from where I live, there's a, a Christmas tree that is at a roundabout on the road. And when I look out my living room window, I can see that tree. And it always gives me a sense of joy. It goes up around the 1st of December. And, and I love to look at it at night when it's when it's all lit up but these little kids were just you know it, it was electricity that you could feel coming from them and I was thinking what a, what a beautiful thing to do and of course I love this time of year when you know things are darkest when you know when our days are so short and we have so much darkness I love that that's the time that we light things up with colored lights or with you know, white lights, twinkle lights, whatever they happen to be. And we make the world where we live a happier, more joyful place because those lights bring us joy as well. And it's, it's such an important thing, I think, to remember because Christmas um, in itself is a celebration of light, the light of the Christ child, the light of God descending into human form, it's symbolic of that. But also, it's Hanukkah, and like Advent, Hanukkah came early this year, and tomorrow, Monday, is the last day of Hanukkah, which is celebrated for eight days by the Jewish faith. 
And one of the things that I love is is the story of Hanukkah. And I've I've done that story before with all of the metaphors and, and so on that I really, really enjoy. But I'm just going to touch briefly on it during this recording because I have other things that I want to say. But Hanukkah, of course, is the celebration of the time 2,300 years ago when the, when the Jews defeated the Greeks and their city was in devastation, complete devastation. Their temple had been destroyed. And as they went into the temple, into the rubble, they, all, of their, all of their oil had disappeared, the oil with which they lit, uh, lit their, um, their candle or their, um, their light, um, which was just one at the time that would be burning always in their temple. And then through the rubble, someone found one little vat of oil that was still lit in the rubble, one little vat of oil. It was just a little container. Now, typically during that time, and, and well, in fact, always, there was always that oil that was burning in the temple 24 hours a day. And as those who found this, this vat of oil looked at it, they thought there's only enough there, maybe for 24 hours, maybe nothing more. But then came their miracle of the light. And that candle, or it's not a candle, but that vat of oil burned for eight full days, by which time they had more olive oil, which they could light and keep the, keep the light going. Symbol of the faith, you know, keep their faith going, their hope, keep everything alive. Those, those miracles, those, those things that happen that sometimes seem so small, and insignificant become everything to us. And so Hanukkah represents the eight days that that candle or that that vat of oil burned. And every night of Hanukkah, Jewish families that are devoted to their faith light candles in their menor menorahs. And and so so it's a special time, but those who, those who are of the Christian faith and even those who are not light trees and they, they light candles, they light, put lights around their windows, all kind and decorate their houses. You know, there, there is this glow in the darkness that is uplifting for people everywhere. It certainly is uplifting for me. And I think for everyone I know, and there are people who just go out from house to house in, in their cars just, just looking for the beauty that people create at this time of year. And so as we look at this time, you know, I think about the environment in which we're living right now. We have seen devastating things in our environment worldwide, but right here at home, right here in British Columbia, devastating floods. And I've talked about that and, 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 um, and talked about the tragedy and, and that we've been praying, absolutely praying for that that rain to stop in terms of the atmospheric rivers that have been happening and that people recover and that roads are rebuilt and that, that all of the suffering turns into hope as people can get back to their homes and, and can rebuild. And so, you know, we, as we look at, at our earth right now, we can see darkness in a lot of places. You know, that flooding could be termed darkness, certainly darkness of the spirit, darkness of the soul, uh, depending upon our faith, depending upon how we look at, at these things. But any way we look at it, it's not a good thing for us to see people experiencing right now, and our hearts go out to all of them. And then the COVID virus that's now been around for a couple of years, hard to believe. I can remember thinking, oh, it'll last a few months and it'll be gone. Well, little did, little did I know how long it was going to last. Little did any of us know how long it was going to last. And now, of course, there's another very variant that's out. And so as we look at these things, again, it's a, it's a kind of darkness on the earth. It's a, a heaviness that hangs over us. There's a kind of anxiety that is attached to it for many, many people. And it's really time for us to go within and to, to kind of figure it all out. And as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago in my talk that 
um, that, that, you know, it's, it's really, it's a time for love. It's a time for us to share our love with others in whatever form that takes. But also, we have to understand that we didn't just sit around and create this by thinking it into being. Because we're, we often say, you know, what you think you are, you are, or what you focus upon expands. We create according to our beliefs. And as I referenced um, a couple of weeks ago, we didn't sit around um, focusing on a flood happening. We didn't sit around focusing on COVID happening. But the thing is, we really need to, as a society, as humanity, to, to examine our moral responsibility, our moral responsibility to the earth, to this environment, our moral responsibility in terms of our health and the health of people everywhere. I, mean, I heard on the news the other night that only 7% of all of the people in all of Africa, all the African countries, only 7% are fully vaccinated. 7%. In South Africa, 20% are fully vaccinated. What is our moral responsibility? First of all, we have a moral responsibility to be taking care of our environment, and we have neglected it for a long time because we, we believed, we're led to believe um, that really it wasn't that serious, you know, that we would get by for a lot longer than we have. And so, so many of us have ignored that. And we can't ignore it anymore. We do have a responsibility to do everything that we can to heal this planet, absolutely everything. Not to say, oh, well, that's for someone else to do. I'll let somebody else recycle. I'll let somebody else get the electric, electric car. Everything isn't necessarily possible because of finances for people. But we can all do something. We can all do things that are responsible, that can help us recover from the environmental disasters that we are experiencing that can help to heal the earth. And in the same way, we can all do something to help the earth recover, to help the humanity recover from COVID. And as it was pointed out and is pointed out repeatedly on the news, that as long as people do not wish to get vaccinated, that there are going to, there's going to be continual um, mutation of this virus, and more and more people are going to be susceptible to it. Now, I know there are some people who are dead against vaccines. It is, it's, it, it's everyone's right to do as they please. But I, I guess the way that I look at it, and I'm somebody who had a, knew that a reaction to the vaccine was really possible because my doctor told me that I'm allergic to something in it, but I had it anyway, and I did get sick for a few weeks, um, both times. Anyway, be that as it may, I felt I had a moral responsibility to my congregation that if I was going to be with them, that I needed to be vaccinated because I needed to protect them in case I was carrying the virus. And what we're seeing is that people who do who have been fully vaccinated still can get the, um, the um, virus. However, most of them do not get sick with it. You know, the symptoms are very mild. The thing is, what is our moral responsibility to all of humanity? You know, someone, someone pointed out, the, well, it, it's been repeatedly pointed out, that people who only get their news from Facebook or from social media are not getting the truth. They're not getting scientific proof. And we really need to examine that. There are some people who cannot have it for, for some personal reasons because of health issues or whatever where it, it would not be good for them to have it. And we have to be tolerant of that and tolerant of people who don't. But also, each of us needs to ask ourselves, what is our moral responsibility? Because when we're in this darkness, we all have one. And we have to figure out what it is that is ours to do and not to be contributing to more sickness on the planet or more disasters on the planet. We need to isolate ourselves if we're not, if we're not going to be immunized against this disease.
so that we don't pass it along to others. And I think of the, the beautiful Carol O Holy Night. The stars are brightly shining. This is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long, long lay the world in sin and error pining. Long lay the world in, in darkness. There have always been dark times. I can't think of a time in history when there wasn't. There have been wars, there have been plagues, there have been all kinds of dreadful things that have gone on. You know, long lay the world in sin and error pining. Now, we don't believe in sin. Um, we believe that sin is missing the mark. Or, you know, as Ernest Holmes would say about evil, that it is a misuse of power because we all have this amazing power within. But we, re we really, really need to look at the alternative of that. You know, the, the traditions of Christmas, the traditions of Hanukkah, the traditions of this holy season are about remembering the eternal truth of who we are, that each of us has the seed of God within us. We are born with it. And that as we allow that seed to grow and blossom, we are allowing the Christ consciousness in us to open up and to, to fully express in this world. You know, the word light itself, metaphysically, means to transcend, means to accept that, that the light is divine and that this divine light can be lit inside us and can grow inside us until we are fully, fully consciously aware of what is ours to do, consciously aware of the power we were gifted with when we were born, that we forgot about, that perhaps we never knew about, but that we can do something about it now. And so as, as we're lighting trees and putting up our Christmas lights this year, it's something for us to contemplate. As we're lighting up for the world, lighting up for God, lighting up for the Christ, it's the Christ within us too, and let us allow our hearts to awaken up and soften and to feel that amazing glow within, know that the light of God is the miracle of birth, the birth of the Christ within us. You know, there we have earthly laws, we have spiritual laws. You know, who doesn't believe in the law of gravity? You know, if you throw something up, it's going to come down unless it lands in a tree and gets stuck there. Or every once in a while we'll see a pair of, uh, of sneakers tied together over a wire somewhere, you know, something, something like that that someone has done. But, but we know that typically if you throw something up, it's going to come down. Or if you drop something, if you knock something off your desk, it's not going to fly up, it's going to fall down. It's a universal law. It's a law of science. And so we don't have any trouble at all accepting that. We don't have any trouble accepting that the sun is going to rise tomorrow. And even if we can't see it, if it's overcast, we know that the sun is there beyond the clouds because it's always there in the morning and the moon is there at night, whether we can see it or not. It's, it's not a matter of, of faith. We absolutely know this to be true. For some reason, we have more difficulty experiencing and accepting spiritual laws because they are invisible just as Gravity is invisible, but we see the result of it. Electricity is invisible, but we see the result of electricity. Spirituality, consciousness is invisible, but we see the results of it. We see the results in our own lives. And so we really need to be contemplative, not just at this time, but all through the year. You know, we're, we're people who are skeptical. We want, we want proof. You know, I love the, the expression, uh, faith, is the, faith is the bird that sings before the dawn. You know, think of those little birds out there when it's still really dark in the morning and you hear them singing. They know the dawn is coming, even though they haven't been to school. You know, they haven't taken any, they don't have any degrees in science. They just have that instinct, that faith, that knowledge 
that the sun is going to come up and they sing. If we could but have that grain of faith within us, our lives in this world would look so different. You know, metaphysically, the light means understanding. And so, if we are fully enlightened, it means that we fully understand who we are and we fully understand the power within and we fully understand what spirit God is, no matter what it is that you want to call it. Our problems that we have on this planet, all of our problems basically are our failure to understand who we really are. Our failure to understand our moral responsibility. We don't just come here to just sit around and be waited on and have everything given to us on silver platters. We come here with a responsibility, a responsibility to honor the Christ within, a responsibility to help one another, to love one another, to create a better world. You know, the meaning of the holidays really, it's almost written in the word holidays, holy days. They are holy days, and if we rem remember that during holy days, miracles are possible. And not just during holy days, but all year round, miracles are possible. We simply have to know that this power is ever working. And when we go into, into that personal place within, when we embrace spirit, where we allow it to be fully awakened within us, then all of our beautiful thoughts take form. But also we know in this teaching that we pray and move our feet. It means we pray and then we listen for what is ours to do and we do it. We get out there and we make it a better world. We don't ignore what's been happening environmentally now for many, many decades. We don't ignore the COVID virus. We do everything that we can to stop it and everything we can to help people in developing countries who do not have access to these vaccines to see that they get them. You know, as one of my doctors said to me, would, you know, would you rather die on a ventilator or um, or have a reaction to the vaccine. No, <laughs> no choice there. Don't want to die on a ventilator in a hospital somewhere. I don't believe that that would be my fate, but I do believe I have a responsibility to humanity to do the best that I can do to keep other people from getting this virus. And so let us dwell in miracle thinking. You know, let us Imagine this world healed, this earth healed, a new earth, a new earth dawning, a new world dawning. Because we choose to live in the light, because we choose the light, not the external lights that are just out there somewhere, but we choose the light within and allow it to really glow, to really shine, and to lead us forward out of the darkness. I read a lovely story a couple of weeks ago. Again, a story of a little boy. From the time that he was very tiny, um, his mom said that he used to go and start standing at the living room window in mid-November. And the neighbors across the street, sometime late in November, would put up their Christmas lights and they decorated their front lawn in a way that no one else did. It was absolutely spectacular. But before they decorated it, their little boy seemed to know it was going to happen. And he would go and stand at that window every night. And then when, the, when everything was lit up, he would let out squeals of delight. And he would jump up and down. He would be so excited. Well, at the time I read the story, he's still doing that today, 21 years later. See, he's autistic and nonverbal. He cannot communicate. 
um, seems to have little comprehension of what is going on. And yet, in the middle of November, at the age of 21, he goes and stands at the living room window, waiting. And when the lights come on, no matter where his mother is in the house, she knows they come on because he shouts with joy. Are we standing at the window waiting for the lights to come on? Waiting for something external to happen in our lives? Or are we consciously creating it? I would suggest that that little boy, that young man, that now adult, is really connected connected to spirit inside himself. And while he may not seem to comprehend much, he knows when the lights are coming on on the outside. And I believe the lights are on in the inside. And so this year, as we decorate our homes, as we light candles, as we, as we light our trees, let us also be conscious of making that light within us brighter and brighter and looking at how we can shine it out onto the, onto the world in a greater way, in a more expansive way. Let us make this season holy. That is the path to light. And so it is. Thank you for being here today. Lovely to have you with us. If you would like to make a donation to our center, please go to um, www.cslvictoria.org and there's a donate button there where you can make a donation which we greatly appreciate or you can send a, an e-transfer to donate at cslvictoria.org um, and you, you'll get a tax receipt for whatever donation you make. Coming up the end of the year a lot of people do want to give at this time not just because it's the spirit of giving but also uh, because it's uh, because it helps with tax time later on. So whatever the motivation, we appreciate whatever it is that you give and whatever it is you do. And for all of you who volunteer to help us in special ways, we're very, very grateful. I also want to let you know that we have now raised close to $3,000 to give to the BC SPCA for flood relief. And we thank you for your contributions. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. And I look forward to seeing you again.